talked with a number of our leaders out across the nation who are all saying the same thing. Something is happening inside the, the body of Christ. There is a, there is a churning. Um, there is a crushing that's going on. I don't think it has anything to do with the end of the millennium. I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that this is 1991 and that we're coming up on the year 2000. I don't think God follows our calendar. If he followed any calendar, he'd follow the Jewish calendar. This is the Jerusalem Post and it says the date is Sivan 5551. That's probably a lot closer to the date. And those of you who are all excited about what's going to happen at the end of this millennium, I think you ought to just calm down a little bit. <laughs> I think God is far more interested in 1991 than he is the year 2000, frankly. I don't know why it's a critical time. I know there's a lot going on that hasn't been going on. I realize that a lot of God's leaders are under attack. They're being crushed like grapes. Let me tell you what I discovered about that. We had a communion service a number of months ago. I was going to illustrate it before our people. So I went out on Saturday night, Jackie and I went down to the grocery store and, and I bought a big a bunch of grapes, whole, what do you call those things? A clump, clump, thanks Jimmy. Clump of grapes. <laughs> and I was going to bring them in on Sunday morning before we, before we served the Eucharist and, and, and illustrate what it was like to, to crush the grapes so that they could be poured out like wine. And I, I had them all in there and I made sure that I wore clothes that if it splattered all over me it would be okay. And, got a nice dish to squeeze them in and I stood up in front of the body and took that big clump of grapes and began to squeeze on it and they wouldn't crush <laughs> and they squeezed and squeezed and they wouldn't crush and suddenly I realized the only way you can crush a grape is to pluck one and squeeze it and it'll pop but when they're together in the clump they don't crush. I put all kinds of pressure on it, but something, there's a dynamic inside of those grapes that keeps them from crushing. That's the reason you can pack them on top of each other. And I should have checked that out ahead of time. <laughs> but it taught me a whole lot about the kingdom of God and about the body of Christ and how much we need one another in the crushing time. That it's only those who are out by themselves who are getting really messed up. The rest of us can get bruised and battered a little bit, but if, we, if we'll be part of that body, part of that clump. You see, I realized this last year how much I need you to stay alive. I've had people tell me for years, please pray for me, and I would say, yes, and then just go on about my way. Or if I prayed, it was a Let's pray right now so that I can forget about you so that we can move on to something else. And, and this last summer I began to realize the power of sustaining prayer when we pray for one another and how much we need the body of Christ during these days, these critical days. And so there's changes taking place in me, there's changes taking place in others. I realize that there's some major changes taking place in the church and the churches. I shudder when I see what's happening in the church. I shudder when I look out across the nation of America and I see the church taking on the flavor of the culture. I'm not saying that all churches should be debt-free, 
but huge debt in this time bothers me as I see the church with its neck in one side of the yoke and the government's neck in the other side of the yoke or the banking industry's neck and try to equate that with what Jesus said about not being yoked with mammon I'm bothered by the glitzy programming last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday and I spoke to our church about the birth of the church and I realized as I was speaking I don't know a single church in America and that includes my church in Melbourne Florida that even slightly looks like the New Testament church the church that Jesus had in mind when he said upon this rock I will build my church we don't look like that anymore I don't know what to do about it I don't think we're all supposed to pull out because if we do that we become loose grapes scattered all over the place and get stepped on by the devil but I know there needs to be someplace in our heart a growing desire to say we want our church to look like Jesus and that we're not going to be satisfied until somehow we come back to that place to where we are the family of God and that is more important than anything else that we understand koinonia and we understand relationships together and so I know that the call of God today is the call to follow Jesus if you have your Bible let me show you some things this morning that God's laid on my heart John the 21st chapter the Sea of Galilee is located in the north central part of the land of Israel in Jesus day the people who lived around that area only made pilgrimage to Jerusalem once a year if then they were only required to go once in a lifetime but usually they made it once a year they would go to one of the festivals in Jerusalem one of the seven great Jewish festivals but it was an 80 mile walk from Galilee to Jerusalem and walking was the only way to get there so you can understand why you didn't go <laughs> drive down commute down once a, once a week or so Jesus made several trips three maybe five during his lifetime from Galilee to uh, Jerusalem the Sea of Galilee is a is in a dish shaped like a harp in fact the the uh, Hebrew word for the Sea of Galilee is Kenor which is the Hebrew word for harp oftentimes it was called the Sea of Kenareth and on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee there were some little villages that were scattered there um, Magdala the place to where Mary Magdalene came from um, Capernaum which was the home of Peter and where Jesus made his home for the last three years of his earthly life Bethsaida which is where Andrew and Philip came from which was just back just a little bit maybe maybe a half a mile off the coast uh, of the of the Sea of Galilee these little villages that were scattered around and if you'd walk on around the coast of the Sea of Galilee on the north side there's a pebble beach Golan Heights go up on one side and then they drop off and there's a huge cliffs and then there's a pebble beach that goes down to the sea and it was there that Jesus met his disciples following his resurrection now this passage in John 21 picks up with that it was following the resurrection of Jesus and the disciples had been out fishing all night long they'd come back they were discouraged they were encouraged by the resurrection and then he disappeared and they didn't know where he was and so they went back to Galilee walked all the way home and picked up their fishing gear again and they were out fishing all night long and hadn't caught anything and, and then they looked over on the shore and there was a man standing there and he shouted to them like you would shout at anybody who's out fishing you catch anything no we haven't caught anything You're fishing on the wrong side of the boat and suddenly they realized who it was it was the master and while the fellows were dropping their nets on the other side of the boat Peter jumped out swam all the way into shore so that he could be there and when he got there the disciples finally rowed ashore with their fish they were there and Jesus had built a little fire a little campfire on the beach and they were cooking fish on the beach and 
had breakfast ready for them. And fellas came in and they stopped and ate there, gathered around, sitting on that little pebble beach. Jesus pulled Peter aside, and I want to pick this up with John 21, verse 15. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And I think he's pointing at the other fellows who are standing around, sitting around. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And I'm not going to go into the exchange of words there, the verbs for love between agape and phileo. You know those. And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. It's an interesting experience there on the Sea of Galilee between Peter and Jesus. Jesus has just told Peter how he's going to die. Now tradition says, and there's some historical evidence to back this up, that that's exactly what happened. That Peter probably wound up in Rome and he was crucified there. He may have been crucified upside down, we're not sure. Tradition says that he chose to be crucified that way, but he wound up in Rome and was crucified there. Jesus has already indicated, he prophesied to them that he's going to die, and he's going to die an untimely death. He's going to either be murdered or he's going to be executed. But when you're old, somebody's going to take you where you don't want to go and do things to you that you don't want them to do to you. And that disturbs Peter. And he looks around and says, what about all the rest of these guys? Just me? What about them? What about that fellow over there in particular? That guy who's always kind of hanging around you all the time and saying nice things. John's remembering all this. He's writing this many years later. And Jesus turns and looks at Peter and he says something extremely crucial that we need to remember this morning. He said, Peter, that's not any of your business. I'm in charge of the length of years. Now, I don't think he could have said this 50 days before. I think he gave that up when he came from heaven and glory to be here on earth. But now he's in a glorified body. Now he's been resurrected. Now all of that power has been returned to him again through the resurrection. And now he's able to say, I am the one who is in control of length of life. If I will for John to live to be 100 and for you to die at 50, what's that to you? Follow thou me. I've got six things I want to give you this morning. How I'm having to apply these things into my own life. First thing is this. How you die, or when you die, is not the question. God controls the length of our years. The question is, are you doing today what he told you to do? You see, Peter made the mistake that I made this last summer, and that I made again in the spring of this year. Peter made the mistake of focusing in on his death. 
I focused in on my death. I'd never focused in on death before. I really believed when I was 50 years of age and was standing in the shower that morning getting ready to have my birthday and thought I was, life had come to an end because I thought that all life ended at 50. <laughs> and heard God say to me while I was staying in the shower, Jamie, I want to give you another 50 years of productive and creative life if you cooperate with me. And I took that at face value and I began living as though I had another 50 years left. See, I, I majored in on the 50 years rather than the cooperation. <laughs> I've discovered that every one of God's promises is in the subjunctive mood, by the way. Every one of them has an if in front of it. If you do this, I will do that. We get so, we get so excited about the promise, we forget about the condition. God wants us to major on the condition, not on the promise. And I majored on the promise that he would give me another 50 years if I cooperated with him, and I forgot about cooperating with him. And then this last year when the doctor told me I was going to die, I suddenly got very serious and my mortality was staring me in the face and I began to realize what it could be like. I even went through one terrible evening, one evening when I laid in bed and all night long planned my funeral. I'd never done that before. It was bad. I see my children standing over my casket weeping and my grandchildren coming in. And, Worrying about the fact that we, we didn't have funeral, uh, I mean, uh, cemetery plots and all that kind of thing. What was my wife going to live on? All my income is dependent on, the, on, on my productivity and creativity. The moment I die, the income stops because we don't have any savings. And so what's going to happen to her? And, and uh, all of those things. That runs through your mind. It continues. And you major on death. Peter was doing that. Jesus said, Peter, this is going to happen to you. And immediately everything within Peter focused in on that terrible fact that Jesus had just prophesied a cruel death for him. And Jesus tried to pull him back off of that and say, Peter, that's not the question. Everybody's going to die. The question of how you die is not a factor here. What I want you to do is to follow me. John, to whom Jesus, Peter, pointed, did live to be a hundred. As far as we know, he's the only one of those early apostles who lived out a natural life and died a natural death on the Isle of Patmos, perhaps at a hundred years of age. Something like that. While he was there, he wrote some letters back to churches and finally sat down and wrote a gospel. And then before he died, he had a revelation of Jesus Christ and wrote that down to five of the books in the New Testament written by him. Peter just wrote a couple of short letters and we don't know how old he was when he died, perhaps my age, maybe a little younger. But the way of death was immaterial to following Jesus. In fact, the scriptures said here that Peter would glorify God in his death. That's the only thing that really matters. That's the only thing that really counts. But God does not want us, and I'm, so I'm preaching to myself this morning. God does not want us to think about our death. God wants us to think about what we are doing today in following him. Because if I am obedient today, maybe he'll give me tomorrow. If I'm not obedient today, there's no reason to believe that I have a tomorrow. Number two, when a person is following Jesus, his life glorifies God regardless of how long he lives or what he accomplishes. Whether this world calls you successful, whether this world remembers you, or whether this world forgets you is nothing. You see, it really doesn't make a difference, and I'm talking to you as leaders in the kingdom of God this morning. It really does not make any difference whether the world or your fellow ministers or Charisma Magazine or Ministries Today calls you successful. They do not measure you the way God measures you. It makes no difference whether the world remembers you or forgets you. 
You see, you see, for centuries, men have tried to memorialize themselves. There's something deep inside of us that says, I want somebody to remember me after I'm gone. And so we, we give money to build buildings and have our names put on it. I was in a Baptist church in Greenwood, South Carolina, where I pastored almost eight years. And we had pews similar to this, except that they were mahogany with white ends and little bronze plaques on the end of each pew with somebody's name on it because they had given the money to buy the pew. And then they were memorialized in the pew so you could walk down the aisle of the church and see all of these people who had given money. And there was a, it was, it was a beautiful fundraising scheme because everybody wanted to have their name on something that was going to be there after they were gone besides a tombstone. I'll not comment on fundraising at this particular time. <laughs> but men for, for centuries have tried to memorialize themselves. Some of you have been to Caesarea by the sea in Israel. There's a, there's a great Roman street that has been unearthed there. The archaeologists have unearthed it. And if you, if you go down that Roman street, you'll see these statues of the Caesars that are there. And they don't have any heads. <laughs> and I had a Jewish archaeologist tell me why. He said these, these Caesars were all trying to memorialize themselves in these beautiful, beautiful statues. And after a while, the sculptors realized that the Caesars only lasted a season, six months, a year. And it was a lot cheaper to, to, to carve the statue without any head. And then when a new Caesar came along, you just carved his head and stuck it up on top of the statue. Like <laughs> because it was going to change later on anyway. The folly of trying to memorialize ourselves. We name our children after our own names. Helen Jr. And that's okay. But these efforts mean nothing to God. God does not judge us on the basis of our accomplishments. I think about Stephen, that early deacon. 27, 28 years of age perhaps. The only thing that he did that could be remembered was the fact that he preached a sermon that so irritated the religious people of the day that they took him outside the city and put him in a pit and they all stood around him with these huge stones, coconut size, and threw them down into the pit until they finally crushed him and he died. And that was the end of his life. Wiped out, he was gone. Oh yes, there was a man standing there holding the clothes of the executioners who could never shake what he saw in that pit until his life was finally so crushed that it was open for the Holy Spirit to encounter him on the way to Damascus. And you and I as Gentiles are followers of Jesus today because of that. Not because of Paul, but because of Stephen. Last week, Jackie and I drove from our home in Melbourne, Florida, down to Vero Beach, which is my hometown, a little town about 30 miles south on the coast of Florida. My mother still lives there. She's 93. She lives in the Baptist Retirement Center, a nursing home. It's on property that my mother and father had given many years before. My father gave all of his property in the, the old homestead and everything to the, to the Florida Baptist Convention for their retirement center. And he had some method in his madness that he, he knew that one day my mother might outlive him and he wanted her to have a place to live. And so she's, she's there. She, she's in the institution, but she's also on the old homestead ground right there where they live for, 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 for more than 50 years. And so we went down to see her last week. That was a groundbreaking. They were going to build a new building. 
And they wanted my family. So my brother Clay came in, and my brother John came in, and my sister Audrey flew in from Missouri. And, and the family all gathered there, and they had a little ceremony for the breaking of the ground of the new building, and the Baptist denominational officials were there. And, and my friend Bill Lord was there, too. Bill, for a number of years, had been the director of the Florida Baptist Retirement Center. And then last year, just about the time I had this cancer attack, Bill had a stroke. He's a man just a couple of years older than I am. And, and he's recovered to some degree. He's able to get up and walk and he, he's mobile, he can do everything, but he's, he's lost the ability to write and, and, he, and he talks a little funny when he speaks because of the effects of the stroke on the motor nerves of the brain. And Bill was there. And I watched him come up with his wife, Joanne. But they ignored him. All the denominational officials ignored him. He was kind of out of the picture, and they, they were honoring the new director, and, and they were talking about this and talking about that. But Bill was just off to the side. He had had a stroke, and he wasn't in charge anymore, and he's out of the picture. And I went over to him and stood there and chatted with him for a few minutes. And, and his wife said, you know, we got a little sandwich shop now downtown. Bill helps me in the sandwich shop. He, he, he works back in the kitchen and he puts the mayonnaise on the bread and he can put the lettuce on the sandwiches. And, and I looked at Bill Lord. Bill for many years had been a denominational official. He served his life with those old people down there. We loved him and he, what a precious man of God. He's got these big tears running down his face. And I just hugged him for a minute. And then as I was walking off, the Lord said to me, Do you think Bill Lord is worth any less today than he was when he was the director of the Florida Baptist Retirement Center? Do you think I love him any less today than I loved him then? And then he said something so precious. He said, Bill Lord is worth more to me now than he ever was way back then because he's following me. And that's the only thing that I judge anybody on is whether they're following me. Number three. When a person is following Jesus, neither the accumulation of wealth or status in the community or the size of your church or the outreach of your ministry nor the length of your life means anything. Only whether you're following Jesus or not. Now you nod your heads and you mumble, Amen. But if you really believe that, if you really agreed with me on that, then why are you spending most of your time struggling with your status and your recognition and the expansion of your ministry? <coughs> rather than following Jesus. Point number four. God seldom reveals His plan until the last minute. What is that to thee? It's none of your business, Peter. Stop worrying about when you're going to die. God seldom reveals his plan until the last minute. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that he is more interested in building our faith than he is in getting us in the right slot.
Peter was looking for a guarantee. He didn't like the possibility of death, especially a violent death. None of us look forward to that kind of thing. Like all of us, he wanted a, he wanted a guarantee of long life. When I finished the radiation treatment, I sat down with the doctor, the last consultation. How desperately I wanted to hear him say, you are now cancer free. It is all gone. You will live a long, healthy life. And I wanted him to write it out on paper and sign it <laughs> and give it to me so I could hold it up before God in case he had any other plans for my life. <laughs> but he didn't do that. There's only one day that's guaranteed. This is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to know my future, but God seldom reveals it. And the reason that he doesn't reveal it is because I would mess it up in planning for it. I'm so grateful when I was in college, Bob, that I didn't know what God wanted me to do. I know that's the same thing. I had no idea what God wanted me to do. And I'm so grateful that he hid it from me if I had known ahead of time, I would have taken a bunch of preacher courses in college. <laughs> and it would have destroyed me. Instead, I studied English literature, which one of my practical friends said with a nickel, you can buy a cup of coffee with that degree. <laughs> now it's 50 cents. <laughs> What do you do with a degree in English literature? The only thing you can do is to write. I didn't know that. I'm so grateful that he hid it from me. Why does he withhold it? Because he's more interested in building our faith than getting us in the right slot. He's more interested in whether I come to him than whether I do what he wants me to do. Now, being in the right place is okay. But God cares about our relationship with Him. How close am I to Him? How dependent am I with Him? Am I following Jesus? It's not whether I'm pastoring a big church or working in the stock room. I talk to so many young men who are so eager to get into a church. And I'm constantly saying to him, get a job. <laughs> but if I get a job, I can't minister. Oh, come on. Join the real world. I've been a bivocational pastor for the last 25 years. I have earned my living outside of my church primarily. It's an honorable thing. I'm not saying that everybody should do that. There are, there's a place for those who have given their full life to the ministry, and I love them and I appreciate them. But don't lock yourself into that and say that's the only way it can be done. God cares about your relationship with Him. And the reason He withholds the future is because He wants to build faith in you. Eight weeks ago when they discovered this thing on my spine, five weeks of radiation, and then just at the end of the radiation, just as I'd finished it, a pain returned. I got all kinds of tingles going up and down my leg, pain in my back. You can imagine what that does with the thought process. 
And so I said to the Lord the other morning, woke up lying in bed, feeling these little tiny aches and pains, same kind of thing I felt when the thing first started. Oh, dear. Lord, why, after going through all of this and getting myself purged and cleansed, and as far as I know, I'm right with you in every area of my life, and, and I've gone through all the treatment that I'm supposed to do, and I'm dependent on, Lord, Lord, why do I still hurt? I need help. And he said to me, would you call on me for help if you weren't hurting? Would you wake up every morning? Saying, Lord, help me if you weren't hurting? No. No, Father, I wouldn't do that. He said, I like it when you call on me for help. And Lord, am I supposed to live this way the rest of my life? What is that to thee, Jamie? Follow me. Depend on me. Forget about how much time you have left. Follow me. My friend Jim Bartholomew is here. Jim's sitting back there. Jim's been a member of our church for a long time. He was on our church staff, our youth pastor. Last year, really felt that he was supposed to leave all that behind and finish his formal education. And so we sent him off to Columbia, South Carolina, enrolled at Columbia Bible College to finish his degree there. And in the meantime, he's been working with Glenn Anderson on the staff and church there in Columbia. Jim called me the other morning, or the other evening, I guess, just, just to bless me. I miss him. Really do miss you, Jim. I miss his big prophetic voice. And so he called me, and we just kind of reminisced a little bit. I said, how you doing? And he said, well, I finished, my, finished all my classwork Thanksgiving. And he said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do at that point on. And I said, what do you think you're supposed to do? And he said, I don't know. What do you think? And I said, Jim, I don't know what you're supposed to do. God's going to have to reveal it to you. I said, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I don't know what my relationship with the church is going to be. God's going to have to reveal it to you. You're going to, have to, you're going to have to walk this one out by faith. You took this step by faith. You're going to have to take the next step by faith. And then I reminded him of a story that I'd written for Corey Ten Boom a number of years ago. A little book I did for Corey called Tramp for the Lord. Some of you remember Corey Ten Boom was an old Dutch woman who, back during World War II, her family had harbored Jews, her Christian family had harbored Jews in Holland, saved them from the Nazis, and had been arrested by the Gestapo. And, her father and her sister both died in the concentration camp, and Corey almost died. And finally, she was released and spent the rest of her life following Jesus. And I wrote this little book for her called Tramp for the Lord, and in which I, she told me a story which I related here, and I related it to Jim the other night on the phone. Corey says, when I was a little girl, I went to my father and said, Daddy, I'm afraid that I'll never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, Father said, when you take a train trip from Harlem to Amsterdam, when do I give you the money for the ticket? Three weeks before? <laughs> no, Daddy. You give me the money for the ticket just before we get on the train. That is right, my father said. And so it is with God's strength. Our wise Father in heaven knows when you're going to need things, too. Today, you do not need the strength to be a martyr. But as soon as you are called upon for the honor of facing death for Jesus, he will supply all the strength you need just in time. 
Number five. God's ways are never our ways, but they are always good ways. Peter learned that, later wrote about it. God's ways are never our ways, but they are always good ways. I got a card the other day from somebody who had attended our church service in Melbourne, mailed it to me. Dear Mr. Buckingham, I've listened to your sermons since I moved to Florida. I've lost everything family, possessions, and some health since living in Florida. No matter how tough life seemed, I would get strength from the Lord through His Word and through the praise and the worship service here at the Tabernacle Church. Today, however, I left the service so weak and depressed. I thought my enemies were boiling, wringing me out hurting me. Today you tell me God is good, and yet I see sinners prosper and enjoy good health and have families that love them. Why is God so good to them? Why does He punish the believer? Thirty years ago, When I was pastoring in Greenwood, South Carolina, I would have had an answer for that young man. One of the things that happens when you grow older and you get closer to God is you know less and believe more. I don't have an answer to this fellow. I'm asking those same questions myself. I can quote scripture. And so can you. And I'm sure there's all kinds of answers building inside of you right now, exactly the way you would answer that. Psalm 73 was written to answer that kind of thing. Why do the wicked prosper? But I have to come back with the same answer that David came back with in Psalm 73. I don't know. I don't know why some people are rich and some people are poor. I don't know why some people who have abused their bodies and smoke and drank and beat their wives and and hoard around all the time, walk through this life and live to be 90 years of age and I've done everything I know is right and I've got cancer cells in my body. I don't know. I don't understand why some babies are born deformed. I don't understand what happened in Bangladesh. I don't understand what's happening to those Kurds up in northern Iraq. My friend Bernie May, who's president of Wycliffe Bible Translators, just returned from Africa, called me on the phone the other day, crying on the phone. He said, 25 million people will die in Sudan and Ethiopia before Thanksgiving. They will starve to death. 25 million. I don't have answers for that. I don't know, but I believe. And the older I grow, the less I walk by sight, and the more I walk by faith. I can tell you about my new walk with the Father. 
Back to Corey Ten Boom, she was always talking when I was with her about walking in the light, walking in the light. And I'd say, Corey, you're always talking about walking in the light, and I understand that, but in Psalm 91, it says that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. How do you walk in the light and be in the shadow at the same time? And she would say, oh, you Americans don't understand. But the closer you get to God, the less light there is until you come into His presence and it is total darkness because in His presence you don't need to see. You just need to believe. In His presence you do not walk by sight. You walk by faith. Back to Stephen, killed at age 27, 28. And you hear Stephen, it's not fair. It's not just. Peter gets to live until 50. Peter says it's not fair, it's not just. John gets to live to be 100. God's ways are not our ways, but they're always good. And I wonder if you ask Stephen how he feels about it. I wonder if you ask him now how he feels about it. He probably can't even remember it because life is such a short span and it's here and it's gone like that. The only thing that counts is following Jesus. When I was a young Baptist boy, we used to stand in this auditorium and sing with eternity's values in view. With eternity's values in view, we shall do each day's work for Jesus with eternity's values in view. The doctor told me, after they took the final CAT scan, had a good report. He says the CAT scan shows that the tumor is shrinking. In fact, the shadows inside of your spine are gone completely and looks like the tumor is responding. And he was so happy and so elated over that. And Jackie and I were happy and elated and we waited until he left the room. And, and we pulled together and held hands and prayed and said, Oh Lord, oh Lord, help us to be happy and elated regardless of the report. That our praise shall not be because of circumstances, but our praise shall be because of you. That we will learn to rejoice not in things, but we shall rejoice in the Lord. Finally, there's a difference in praying and wishing. Peter had to learn that. The last week, we were in St. Petersburg. We were driving over to the medical center for the, for the CAT scan. This final examination they were going to take. We were praying that the, in the car as we drove over. I was driving. Jackie was beside me. We were praying... Lord, we really pray that the CAT scan will show only good things, Lord. And then I stopped and realized we're not praying. <laughs> we're wishing. And Jackie brought me up on it, and she's right. There's only one legitimate prayer, and that's to find out what Jesus is praying and to pray his prayer along with him. Hebrews says that Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. When we find out what he is praying and we enter into agreement with him, that prayer will always be answered. See, the problem is I might not like what Jesus is praying. Unfortunately, I've come to realize that most of our prayers are not prayers at all. They're just wishes. James says the reason they're not answered is because we, we're praying amiss, not looking at the right things and saying, what is God saying to me? And I know what he's saying to me. Jamie, get out of the way. If you don't get out of the way, I'll take you out of the way. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that with my church. I don't know how to do that with, 
what ministry God wants me to have. 12, 13 years ago, I wrote Catherine Kuhlman's biography after having followed her around for a number of years, written other books for her. When I finished the biography, the Catherine Kuhlman Foundation sued the publishing company to try to stop the publication of it. We sat down finally and negotiated the whole thing out of court with a bunch of Jewish lawyers. <laughs> Stupid. And it came out that what the foundation really wanted was that they wanted her image to be unsullied, untainted by the truth. But she was a very wise woman. And she left no legacy. And she did not give her mantle to any man. She had done her job and she just got off the scene. And now, 12, 13 years later, I'm seeing coming up out of the ground new ministries. Many of them having some of the same flavor. But it's not because her mantle has passed. It's simply because she was smart enough to get out of the way and let God do what he wanted to do. And I've been struggling with Luke 9, 23, where Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. And I never struggled with that verse before until it became desperate enough to try to save my life. And now what do I do with this? And I was saying, Lord, Am, am I not supposed to try to save my life? Am, am I not supposed to take any medical treatment? Am I, am I, what am I supposed to do? And, 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 and he said to me very specifically, he said, no, it's okay. I want you to do that. I want you to resist death. But at the same time, I want you to save your life for my sake and not for your sake. Not for what you will do, but for what I want you to do. He said, nail it all to the cross. Put it all up there. You can't have any of it. Just put it all up there and die to it and follow me. And I realized while all this was going on that last summer when I went through this and I went through it then but all the things I nailed to the cross then were the things that were wrong in my life. This time he said, everything you nailed to the cross are the things that are right in your life. It's all got to go there. All the things that are wrong and all the things that are right, it all, it all goes there. And I come away and say, I take, O cross, thy shadow. From my abiding place, I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross.